Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, in today's video, I'm going to go over the Taraj defense, one of the most aggressive and interesting ways for Black to follow up uh, to the Queen's Gambit declined. And the reason why this is the second video in the series is because it again avoids playing Knight of Six for Black on move three, which leads to the main lines. Okay. I'm going to show you the opening moves first to see how to enter the Taraj defense. So we have d4, uh, we have d5, a classical response by black, c4, the queen's gambit, e6, the queen's gambit declined, and after white plays the move knight c3, black now, now plays c5, challenging the center and playing actively from the start. Now, a few, uh, a few points about this defense. It's quite dissimilar to normal Queen's Gambit declined lines in the sense that it doesn't have the same strategic uh, features. Most importantly, instead of having to figure out how to develop, especially his light squared bishop, black is going to have an easy time doing that because the move c5 forces white to a decision in the center and white basically has to make a choice now because if he doesn't do anything let's say white plays i don't know a stupid move such as h3 well then black could destroy the entire center take both ways or uh, open the center up and have an easy game with all of his pieces on open files open diagonals therefore after the move c5 uh, the only theoretical move for white the only good move for white is to take c takes d5 and after c takes d5, e takes d5, we see the most important point behind the move c5, and that's that the c8 bishop is now free to roam on the diagonal, and it can be developed to, to g4, e6, f5, doesn't matter. The point is there's no pawn on e6, while at the same time black hasn't conceded to playing c6 to defend his center after the queen's gambit, thus leaving a square for his knight on c6. So uh, regarding peace play, the tarash is perfect. Now to the downsides. The downsides of the Tarash are that black will often have uh, to concede to having structural def uh, defects. Most importantly, an isolated queen's pawn, as we are going to see in several lines. You can see immediately that if white chooses to, for example, on move 4, take on c5, even though that's not played, takes, bishop takes, we now immediately see that black is the one with uh, with the structural difficulty here. He has an isolated queen's pawn that's not easy to defend. Okay, uh, so black plays the Tarash to have dynamic play, to have active pieces, open lines, open diagonals, open files for his rooks, and concedes to having a structural uh, damage to his position. That means that black will generally want to avoid playing endgames in this position and he will want to have uh, a position in which, pe in which his peace activity is going to be highlighted in an attack in offensive play and trading pieces off is, usual, is usually going to favor white. Okay, now the opening was of course uh, taught, uh, taught up by Sigbert Taras, uh, one of the old guys one of the best players in early chess developments and that was his main defense and even though uh, it has survived uh, until today, there have been many changes and many theoretical developments to the opening. For example, in this position, so we have d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, uh, c5, uh, the Tarash, cd5, ed5. The old move, the way people used to play against Zygbert Tarash was e3, which is quite passive, leaving this bishop hemmed in, giving black a choice. A very pleasant choice of playing c4, playing c takes d, uh, several interesting ideas, and this is very passive, doesn't uh, use white's time and white's first move to, uh, to go for an advantage, it rather justifies the move c5. And if e3 is played, then the move c5 can be given, given an exclamation mark. However, knight f3 is the move which is played now, and that's the only uh, that's the only move that strong players play nowadays. And before we continue to the three uh, main uh, variations we are going to be looking at, I'm going to uh, try to explain the opening moves which are basically forced. So if you want to play the Taraj defense, and if you play the queen's gambit with white, these moves you simply have to know. Okay, so after knight f3 we have knight to c6. Uh, putting pressure on the center and one of the main squares around which the battles are going to be fought is going to be the d4 square. 
That means that uh, white is going to be defending the, the, the d4 square, black is going to be putting pressure on it. Conversely, d5 square in black's position is going to be quite weak because of the pawn on d4. Okay, and now uh, here is the point, uh, and this is a move on move 6, which challenged uh, Tarash's defense for the first time, uh, and basically put it to the test. That's the move that's played every game today, that's the move g3. Now what does g3 do? Well, firstly, you're not playing e3, that means that your c1 bishop can develop freely, uh, after you castle, you don't have to develop it immediately before playing d3. You've basically solved a big problem in your position. This is similar to many uh, Karokan positions in which black has to choose whether he wants to play e6 or develop the bishop first or go for a fianchetto setup and leave the pawn on e7. So the move g3 places the light squared bishop on the g2 square, which is very important considering that black will most likely have an IQP on d5, an isolated queen's pawn, which is already attacked twice. If this pawn is traded off for, let's say, the c5 pawn, then you can see the knight, the queen, and the g2 bishop all converging on the d5 square. So objectively, g2 is the optimal square for the light squared bishop. Black continues with knight to f6, we have bishop to g2, and now bishop to e7. Both sides castle in this position, and this is what every game in the Tarash is going to look like after 8 moves for both sides. So what can we say about this position? Well, there's tension here, and white now has to make a choice. We are going to be looking at two moves for white, the only two uh, moves which are thought to give white an edge here. Uh, there are several several other moves which I'm not going to be focusing on. That's the move b3, which has a specific idea behind it. The move bishop to e3 and the move bishop to f4. Now I'll just briefly talk about the moves. There are some lines uh, in which black follows up with the move c4 uh, and hence the move b3. b3 indirectly stops c4. In lines which we are going to be looking at with c4, white always plays b3 at some point. He, he tries to disrupt that structure. Otherwise, black is going to have a solid 3-2 to two pawn advantage, and if black is allowed, for example, c4, a6, b5, b4, then black would be positionally much better, and black would want to trade the pieces off and have a solid pawn majority to try and win the game with. Therefore, the move b3. But that's a sideline which is quite unnecessary, and the two main moves are far more active. Okay, uh, the move bishop to e3 uh, simply uh, defends the center, defends the d4 square, which, as we said, is the most important square in the position, and develops the bishop. The move bishop f4 develops the bishop to an active square, but not the most active square. So the two moves that we are go going to be focusing on are the move bishop g5, and the move d takes c5. Now the idea behind both moves is quite clear. The move bishop g5 tries to put pressure on the d5 pawn immediately, basically trying to remove the defender of d5 in conjunction with the weakness of the e5 square. So if we imagine the f3 knight coming into e5, then we can see that with the bishop on g5 threatening to take on f6, the c3 knight, the g2 bishop and the queen, uh, the d5 square and the d5 pawn are very weak. The idea behind d takes c5 is to give black an isolated queen's pawn. And once you give black an isolated queen's pawn, you are happy to trade the pieces off. You basically want to enter an endgame, and black is the one who has to force the move d4 through to try to either liquidate his pawn or, crea or create dynamic pressure with it. One problem with playing d4 for black after d takes c5 is that the g2 bishop gains a lot in scope and in activity and basically becomes a much better piece. Okay, uh, now castles and this position on move 8 uh, used to be followed up with bishop g5 almost exclusively uh, in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, among others Paul Keres, Petrosian, a lot of people played this position. Uh, in the early 80s and late 70s, people began playing d takes c5. Among the first players to seriously devote time to that move was Gary Kasparov, and then in, against Karpov in 84, he had trouble uh, with this move, so he switched to um, so he switched to the normal uh, to the normal Queen's Gambit declined uh, lines with Black. Sorry, I'm I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the move Bishop G5 and then C takes D4 for White. 
Okay, so Kasparov was the first one to invent the move c takes d4, and it was a promising move. Today, uh, it's still the main line, but it has some issues, which we are going to go over to. And then, as I said, he later switched on to normal queens can be declined, which he deemed safer, and indeed they are. Okay, so uh, for white, we are going to be looking at bishop g5 and d takes c5 on move 9. Uh, first, uh, I want to show you something that's quite important for the Tarash. The Tarash is a defense which can be played against many different setup, setups, which is very useful. So you can play it against English setups, Reti setups, uh, Queen's Gambit setups. So let me show you an example. Let's say white starts with the move c4. You continue e6. Uh, they go knight c3, and this is now the Asian court defense in the English. You go d5. You now, by far, the, the best move is d4, of course. And after d4, c5, you now have the Tarash. Another example, uh, let's say white starts with the Reti, knight to f3. You go d5. Uh, they go c4 or g3. Let's say c4. e6, uh, d4, c5. Again, you see that this is starting to look... Like a Tarash defense, knight to c3, knight to c6, we have the Tarash. Let's say on move 2, white goes for g3, trying to play the king's Indian attack. Uh, you go c5, they go bishop to g2, knight to c6, d4, e6, c4, knight to f6, and now again takes, takes. And we now again have the Tarash defense with already the bishop fianchetto on g2. So it's fairly transpositional, and you will see it emerging from many uh, different move orders, and... It's a good way to get your opponents to play what you want. If you master the Tarash, you can make sure that against most c4, knight f3, and d4 openings for white, you, you could be able to enter it. Okay, before moving on to the main lines, I want to discuss positions in which white doesn't play the move knight c3, which is the easiest way to enter the Tarash. What if white continues with knight f3, which is quite common? Well, you still go for c5. This is so, sort of the pseudo Tarash defense. And white continues in the same way uh, as against knight c3, c5. So cd5, ed5 weakening the center. g3 again going for the same idea. Knight to c6. Bishop to g2, knight to f6, castles. And after bishop to e7, at this point, there just is no better way to play this position for white than with knight to c3. So I'd like to mention that as opposed to, let's say, the Nimtso Indian problem, when white doesn't play knight c3, he plays knight f3, so we have to go for the queen's Indian or something else. Uh, you don't have those issues here. You can still play in the Tarash fashion with black, and you can just play your normal moves until white plays knight c3. If they go knight b to d2, well, then that's a concession. You might continue with c4, and and you're better. You might also win the d4 pawn. Okay, now let's get on to the main lines. So d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, the tarash, cd5, ed5. As I said, the first eight moves you just have to memorize. Knight f3, knight c6, g3, white wants the bishop on g2, knight f6, bishop g2, bishop e7, castles, castles. First, we are going to be looking at the move bishop g5. And we are going to be looking at two moves for black. Black has two good moves in this position after bishop g5. And we are going to be looking at the main line first. The main line is c takes d4. C takes d4 accepts an isolated queen's pawn and, as I said, goes for dynamic play. Knight takes d4 is the best move. And in this posi position, black continues with h6. Bishop to e3, you want to be defending the d4 square, and rook to e8. And now, uh, after rook to c1, which, according to Kasparov, was the best move, and according to theory, uh, black has several options. The best one, by far, is bishop to f8. You can also continue with bishop to g4, putting pressure on e2, or bishop to e6. But bishop to f8 is the most principled way to continue. And now white uh, sort of accepts a concession. Uh, and tries to exploit a weakness in black's position. If you know uh, Karlsbad structures and minority attacks, then you will know that the idea of a minority attack is to go a3, b4, or rook b1, b4, b5, when the pawn is on c6, trade off your b5 pawn for the c6 pawn, force b takes c6, and then create a weakness on c6, which is pretty immobile and which can be blockaded. Okay, so what's the idea here for white? White plays knight takes c6, b takes c6. And again, if you are familiar with uh, 
uh, Carlsbad structure plans, then this is a weakness you can exploit. How do you exploit the weakness? You blockade it first, put pressure on it later, hence the move knight to a4. And this, in my opinion, is a problem in the Tarash, because you do have activity, you have two very good bishops, uh, you have your rook on the semi-open file, um, a lot of activity, but this knight is coming to c5, and you are going to have trouble developing. Bishop to d7, defending the pawn, bishop to c5. Now, why does uh, white play bishop to e3? Why does white play bishop to c5? Because the knight is not staying on a4. White wants to challenge the defender of the c5 square and create an outpost for his knight. So strategically, this is very easily understandable, trading of the dark squared bishops. So black basically has no better options. He doesn't want the king on f8, nor does he want to underdevelop his rook with rook takes f8, so bishop c5, knight c5. And now we can see the features of this position. White has a dominant knight on c5. White has a very good bishop on g2. White has uh, a weaker center, of course. Black holds the center with his d5, pawn controlling e4 uh, and c4. And often the knight could jump into e4, the bishop could go to g4 or, or f5 and try to put pressure. So the position is balanced, but structurally white is simply better. White has two pawn islands, no backwards pawns, no blockaded pawns. Black has a backwards pawn on c6, uh, for the moment blockaded by the knight. So if the blockade is lifted, fine. But he also has an isolated a7 pawn. And if you traded all the pieces off, just imagine removing all the pieces of the board, white should have a close to a winning or a winning endgame. Okay, so uh, black doesn't want to give up his bishop, so bishop to g4. We have rook to e1 as the main move, defending, double pressure on e2. Queen to a5, uh, putting pressure on the knight, putting pressure on a2. h3 is the main move, forcing the bishop back, bishop f5, and now the position continues. But this is, this is a position you have to study. I don't want to go much deeper into it here, because now there are still 20 games played from this position, but we are now treading really high level territory if we start analyzing this you just have to remember that in the main lines if you play the tarash you're going to be stuck with this and this is not easy to play with okay and that's what happens if on move nine after bishop g5 black takes on d4 which is the main move objectively the best move now let's look at the position with c4 after bishop g5 uh, you might be wondering well why why would black accept that why would black go for that and i agree so I think that uh, the move I'm about to show you is an alternative which, albeit leads to complicated positions in a different way, could be more favorable for black. And that's the move c4. You simply don't allow white to isolate your, your pawn easily. You're forcing him to go for a concession himself. You're forcing him to play b3 to challenge your center. And that's, that's something because a, he's going to have an isolated pawn on a2, b, uh, he's going to take, you're going to have a passer on c4, which doesn't happen, but could happen uh, with something like a6, um, b5, and if he takes on c4, that could happen. So knight e5 is the continuation for white, putting pressure on, on d5, and now if black makes a mistake, for example, black plays a very bad move such as h6, well then bishop takes, bishop takes, and all of a sudden your position is just busted. Okay, and there's there's basically nothing you can do. You could take here twice, but still, uh, white should have an easy game. So after knight e5, you play bishop e6, defending d5. And now again, black uh, has to concede to having structural uh, uh, defects in his game. Knight takes c6, b takes c6, and now if white plays meekly, inactively, uh, with slow moves, well, black is great. Black is going to go c5, open up the center, get his bishop to c5, and hopefully play the move d4, chasing the knight away, play the move d3, create a passed pawn on d3, and win. But black knows that white is not a bad player, white plays the move b3. And now it's not easy. It's not easy to hold your center. You are again going to be left with a huge weakness on c5 if you're not, care if you're not careful. So let's imagine you take, uh, white takes, you go something like rook to b8, Okay, I'm just going to show you that. Takes, takes, rook to b8, knight to a4, this knight is coming to c5, 
And if uh, the, the, the c6 pawn can be blockaded, then white should hold uh, an advantage here. Even if you give up your bishop and the, the, the d4 pawn uh, is on c5, white should be slightly better. So after b3, black has to play energetically too. Queen a5 attacking the knight, knight to a4 looking at the c5 square. Rook f to d8 defending d5. e3 now finally consolidating his position. And now the move here, which you have to remember if you play this position with c4, is that you have doubled c pawns, so you might as well liquidate your weakness. You play the move c5. And after c5, black is fine, and this is why I like this position. Bishop takes f6. You obviously cannot take uh, with the bishop because you lose your c5 pawn, so g takes f6. d takes c5, bishop takes c5, and queen h5. And you have a position in which black has the bishop pair, what white could take it at his own leisure. So white could also play knight c5, queen c5 on the previous move, but queen h5 is just the bad, best move. And black has a lot of dynamic play. So the g2 bishop is a monster, obviously, but as soon as you, let's say, play rook a to c8 and start pushing your pawn, let's say you play c3, it's not going to be easy to start an attack, especially because it's not easy to get your rooks into the game as white and start putting pressure on, on black's king side. So the move c4 is, in my opinion, on move 9, a good alternative to taking uh, on d4, which is the main line. Okay, now uh, let's look at an alternative for white. Uh, on move 9, instead of playing the move bishop to g5, white could force matters and instead of allowing black to take on d4 instead of allowing black to play c4 you can opt not to play bishop g5 at all and you can simply take on c5 and in a book on the tarash written by jacob agard he says that this is the move of the future okay the move uh, the book was written a while back but still it's uh, it should be a good a good book on the tarash so d takes c5 Bishop takes c5, and now we see that white is forcing the matters with an IQP. So if you know how to play against an isolated queen's pawn, this is a move for you. If I'm white, I would play this. I wouldn't play bishop g5. You can play bishop g5 on the next move. Now what have you done? You have developed the bishop to c5. That's true. You have also made this pin way more annoying without the bishop. So in many positions you will be threatening the move knight takes d5. And black has only one way to continue the position. Black has to play energetically. Black has to play the move d4. And now what does this imply? Well, as soon as the side with the IQP can uh, get rid of the pawn, then it's not a weakness anymore. And as we can see in this position, this would be a fairly, um, fairly simple pawn structure. If these two pawns got traded off, it would be symmetrical. But white is not going to allow that to happen. So we know that we are going to have an aggressive game. So the way to react to d4, and this is again something you have to, you have to learn. This is known as the Timan variation, named after Jan Timan. Bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, and knight to d5. And I think this is a good position for white. Although black has... Uh, the bishop pair, black has peace activity, and the d4 pawn, even though it's weak, creates a lot of pressure. You have d3 options, uh, discovering your bishop on the, on the f2 pawn. You also can use, if these two pawns were to move, I'm sorry, if these two pawns were to move, you can use the e3 square and the c3 square as outposts for a knight on the third rank, which is great. But for now, you have to deal with this tempo. Uh, the move queen f5 has been tried, putting pressure on the knight. But now knight to d2, rook to d8, double pressure on the knight, knight to f4. May seem a bit awkward for white, but it's fine, better for white. Uh, bishop to d6, again, putting pressure on the knight, threatening to win a pawn. Knight to d3. And now bishop to e6. And you have forced the knight away a bit. You have blockaded your, your d4 pawn voluntarily, which I don't think is wise. So if white knows what he is doing, you don't get much from the move queen f5. That's why it's not the main line, but it's still playable. The main move after knight d5 is simply retreating the queen to d8, and that's the best move. Again, we have knight to d2. You have to defend the knight. Rook to e8, attacking e2. Rook to c1, attacking the bishop, bishop to b6. Now taking on b6 would allow queen b6, pressure on b2, pressure on f2, and that's not the best option. Instead of that, knight c4 is played. Double pressure on the bishop, and now bishop to g4. 
Uh, you don't have time to take on b6 uh, because bishop takes e2 wins. So you go rook e1 defending and now bishop a5 attacking the rook forcing this trade. Knight a5, queen a5. You may be wondering why would he want to trade his bishop for the knight? Well, with the pawn on d4, your bishop is a tall pawn. It's a defender of a pawn. So trading of one of white's active knights will benefit you. And in this position, you have, you have pressure on white's position, but you don't want to trade the pieces off. And again, I like this move for white. I would play 9, d takes c5 if I was white instead of bishop g5, because I think long term this is easier to play for white. As black, if you manage to liquidate your pawn with the move uh, d3, which can be played in some positions because of this annoying pin. Let's say the knight is not here, you go knight b4, you are threatening d3. So black could have an equal position if white is not careful. However, white should try to blockade the pawn. Uh, isolated pawns have to be blockaded and then play around it, try to trade the pieces off and win the pawn. Black, on the other hand, needs to put pressure at as many points as possible. Okay, so to, to finish the video, the, the Tarash is a very interesting defense which leads to imbalanced positions, uh, usually with an isolated queen's pawn in which black wants to go for attacking pressure. It has been played since Zygbert Tarash's times until today, so it's a sound defense, it's not unsound, but it requires a lot of patience, experience, and you have to have no fear. As a weaker player, I fear positions in which I'm structurally worse, so I dread playing an IQP position in which I'm the defender. But if you can get past that irrational fear and look at the position objectively and see what dynamic compensation you have in, re in return, this is a defense for you. Again, you can transpose to it from many different orders, from the move orders, from the Reti, from the English, uh, and it's quite uh, an easy defense to master. If you go 25 moves deep, okay, it gets trickier, but the opening up to level, I would say, 2,000, 2,100, you can learn in a day. Okay, hope you liked the video. Tomorrow I'm going to continue the series on the QGD, and uh, stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye, thanks.